Now, I would like to introduce the author for the famous book, Two. Two, with two characters from two different places telling two different stories, written in two different point of views. Paru Anand is the Baal Sahitya Academy Puraskar winner. She has written books for children, young adults, and adults. She also works with children in schools and NGOs through her program, Literature in Action, and holds a world record in helping over 3,000 children in difficult time in making the world's largest newspaper. She has, been the, uh, she has been awarded for her contribution for children's literature by Russian Center for Science and Culture. No Guns at My Son's Funeral, open to rave reviews, and was on the international board on books for young people uh, on a list, and has been translated into German and French, and has been adapted, very soon it's gonna be adapted into a movie. So I would li like you all to invite Paro Anand on stage. And the reason why my books are in the chair and I am standing is because my books brought me here. Paro Anand didn't come here on her own. And if the books are ever gone, then Paro Anand is gone as well. So they are my stars. They are my path. They are the ones that show me the way. Um, I'm going to start with a short reading from my book, Wingless. And then I'm going to tell you why this book. Out of the 26 books that I've written, why this book? It's called Wingless, A Fairly Weird Fairy Tale. When Princess Chutki was born, to the king and queen of angels, there should have been much rejoicing and happiness. Guys, if you all move forward, maybe I can drop the mic. What do you say? Because my voice is kind of echoing all over. No. Okay, okay, don't drop the mic. Okay, but come forward. That's a, <laughs> I, I would love to have everybody much closer. There should have been much rejoicing and happiness. There should have been music, festivals, feasts and gifts. There should have been a smile on the face of everyone who lived in the diamond and silver land where King Quicksilver and Queen Sparkling Gem ruled justly and wisely, just as any good king and queen should in any good fairy tale. But this isn't a good fairy tale, it's a fairly weird fairy tale. So none of these joyful things happened. No, musical instruments were broken. Bram! Festivals were banned. Feasts that cooks had been preparing for weeks and weeks were thrown away for dogs and cats and crows to feed on. Gifts wrapped and ready for the new princess were hidden away in dark corners for dust to settle on and spiders to spin their webs on. The smiles on the faces of everyone turned to frowns or even tears, real watery salty tears. Not the tiny diamonds and pearls that angels weep on the few occasions when angels weep. And those who wept hardest of all were King Quicksilver and Queen Sparkling Gem. They had so looked forward to their baby and hoped she would be everything that a good and perfect angel should be. But she, she was perfect, well, almost perfect. But she wasn't perfect enough. What was wrong with her? What was wrong with her, you think? She didn't have wings. You're very clever. People who came to see her opened their eyes wide with horror as their jaws fell with loud thuds to the floor. Some were speechless and hurried wordlessly away. Others could only weep and wash the floor with their tears. Still others had tongues that would not. Stop wagging. 
the king and queen must have done something very terrible to have a daughter like this. The kingdom of angels is doomed. The end is in sight. We must kill this freakish princess before she kills us. She has brought hell to heaven. She must be punished. She must be killed. That's all I'm going to read. <laughs> See, that's how to sell your book. Just leave it at a cliffhanger. <laughs> so, why this? Why this? And where did this story come from? I was, I've worked with a lot of children in difficult circumstances. I also work with the very privileged children. And when a law for right to education was passed, there were a lot of special need children. A lot of schools had a special section in their school. There were also poor children, the EWS, economically weaker section kids. There were also those who couldn't manage the school system but were in a national open school system but were part of the school. And I noticed when I went into classrooms, there were little islands and pockets. The mainstream children sat front and center, and all the others, the open school, special need, economically weaker section, were in pockets by themselves. And while the school proclaimed that they were an integrated school, the fact is, the minds and hearts of those of the school, whether students or anybody else, were not integrated at all. I asked children about discrimination and uh, they talked about apartheid in South Africa where blacks, they talked about slavery in the US. I asked what about in India, they said no there used to be a caste system, there's none anymore now. Um, I said what about between boys and girls, yeah yeah in villages it happens, doesn't happen now. So I started playing a game with them, asking them about people who live in their house or people who they meet on a daily basis. So the answers came thick and fast, father, mother, brother, sister. Who else? Um, oh yeah, my grandmother comes and stays with us for three months. Who else? Um, yeah, there's some uncles and aunts, like when we go on holidays, we're all together, they're those. Who else? And then it started. Um, my dog, my cat, ha ha ha, very funny, very funny. Who else? Nobody else. There's nobody else. Are you sure? Yeah, no one. What about the cook? the maid, the driver of your bus coming to school or your car coming to school, you don't meet them every day? Yeah, 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 we do. Those were the kind of pockets of discrimination that we all, when you bring the truth closer and closer to yourself, you find that it does apply. Uh, Recently, um, a, the book for which I have won the Sahitya Academy Award is a book called Like Smoke. And the book starts with a very strange line. The line is, I hate Muslims. I hate Muslims. And people who open the book and think, Paro Anand hates Muslims, but no. These are not Paro Anand's words. These are words that I heard after some bomb attack had happened or something somewhere. And I was in a school, a very privileged school. I was on the balcony during break time. And I heard a voice which flew up at me like an arrow and pierced me. Loudly this child had said, I hate Muslims. No embarrassment of 
speaking these words out loud. No embarrassment of actually expressing this feeling. So I peeped over the balcony to see who, who had said this, how were others reacting. There was a group who were all saying, yes, we hate Muslims. I then, my eye was caught by one child who was standing on his own, a little away. The child was pale, the jaw was clenched, and his shoulders were drooped. And it was very, very obvious that this was a Muslim child, and he had heard these words, carelessly spoken. And these kids were so oblivious to the hurt that they were causing. They, why would 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds even know what a Hindu or Muslim was? When I was growing up, I didn't know that my best friend, I've known him since I was in class two, his name is Faisal. I, I didn't know he was Muslim. Why do we all, why are we so conscious of differences rather than others? In an interview just recently for a paper, the reporter asked me, what is it that you, what is one word in which you can describe your writing? one word to describe it, and the word I thought of was inclusive. Let's stop breaking out of the, uh, let's stop breaking out of the differences that we have and start finding common ground instead. And I think that one powerful way to do it is through stories. I used to write initially for a very privileged urban set of readers in expensive schools. But then I started going into villages and meeting um, other kids. And I realized how much depth there is in our country and we need to plumb those depths and di discover those depths, each and every one of us. I still do write also for very privileged children because I think they're the ones who are going to grow up and make the world a better place. And I hope to do that through my stories and I'll just, I think I'm almost out of time. Um, so, the, I, I told a story on domestic violence. I wish I could perform that story for you, but there isn't the time. But I, I had performed a ghost story and I'd performed a story on domestic violence in which a young boy sees his sister-in-law being beaten by his drunken brother and he puts a stop to it. After I had told this story, all the kids went off to have their breakfast, and um, one girl remained behind, and she said, are these stories true? And I said, what do you think? And she said, well, the ghost story one, obviously not, but the one about where the bhavi is being beaten, where the sister-in-law is being beaten, is definitely true. And I said, how can you say, how can you be so sure? And she looked at me and she said, because it happens in my house. So I said, what do you feel when this is happening? What are you feeling? And she said, I feel helpless. I feel angry, but I can't do anything. Uh, by this time, some other kids came and many of them spoke similar things that they had experienced. So many of them in their neighborhood, within their wider family, or even in their own homes, there was domestic violence. They knew of it. Young children knew of domestic violence. So um, I asked them, what can you do? And one boy said, when I, get, when I grow up and get married, and I'm angry with my wife, I'll fight with her. I'll scold her, but I won't hit her. That's what I can do. And the girl said, we can refuse to be beaten. That's what we can do. I don't know whether that this will ever happen, but if even one child, after hearing this story, 
and he's grown up and he stops himself from hitting, I would feel that my purpose as a writer, as a human being has been served. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. Um, do you normally write about um, the problems in the world or what, uh, that you see around and where do you get the inspiration for these stories? I, as I said, I've worked with a lot of, I work with a lot of children in difficult circumstances. And one thing that I found is that they need their stories told. They want their stories out there. And I think that you need to hear those stories. So a lot of those are inspired by young people who I meet, but I do also write fun stories and um, lighter stories, ghost stories, all kinds. Yes, yep. So uh, you wrote a book, um, so don't you think you could write a book on domestic violence like in houses or in family to spread awareness? Like uh, with a book because children would read that book and understand instead of like going to every school and telling them wouldn't you want to write a book about it so they could spread awareness quickly? Yeah, it is, it is actually in a book. Uh, that story is in a book. And what I found with that particular story of domestic violence, every time I would read that story to kids, um, one or two children would become extremely uncomfortable. And I would realize that they are experiencing domestic violence in their own homes. And so I wrote another story, which is in Like Smoke, uh, about um, what to do, how to get out of that. Yeah. So I do write about those things as well. Yeah, yeah I don't... Mm -hmm. and, then, and then at the back there. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the life of a writer? And in particular, your day or your morning writing routine. Right. Um, I lead a very, so I lead a really complicated life. I have lots of commitments. I travel insanely much, and but I write every single day, every single day, and um, I try and write for two hours a day at least. Uh, sometimes it may not be at a two-hour stretch. It may be. 15 minutes at a time, half an hour at a time. I love traffic jams. One of my best and most effective places to write are traffic jams. I call, I call it surfing the jam because I sit and in my car with my laptop and my headphones. I'm not driving. So just, just to clarify, <laughs> I'm being driven. Uh, and I lose myself in that work at that time. And sometimes the jam is opening up and people are, you know, phew, thank goodness. And I'm like, no, 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 let it jam up for 10 minutes more. Because <laughs> I need to. Um, so, but but I, I steal time to write. But I write every day. Okay, so uh, if you were to give out one message to all children that uh, uh, every, everybody who reads your books, uh, what would it be? Yeah, I was asked this, one message, one word to describe. Um, it would be to be inclusive and to feel the empathy. Empathy in the sense that, and I discovered that when I, I, I literally walk in my character's shoes and I literally feel what it's like to be that person at that time in that circumstance. And that, I think, has made me a much more empathetic person. I can really, because I, I mean, until as a writer, my heart beats for that child, or that child's heart is beating within me, until then, there isn't the authenticity to write, to, uh, to my story. Ma'am, as a mother, I want to ask one question, like the topics that you are dealing with, discrimination, domestic violence. So, how old should be a child to introduce to such subjects? Like, my son is 11. I don't think I want him to hear about these harsh realities yep. so soon. Yep. So, I'm in a dilemma. Should he read such yep. things or should he not read such things? Okay. It's a great question and it's certainly a concern for teachers and uh, parents and my books have been banned out of some schools. Um, I'm 
I'm privileged to be a band author. So, um, I, you know, when we were children, when I was growing up, uh, and I'm 60 years old, so it was a long time ago, I, I, uh, there was no monitoring of what we read. We, and there weren't very many children's books as such. So we pulled books off the shelf and we read them and if we found that we weren't understanding it, we'd put it down. And I think this has not actually changed. What has changed is that adult interfering and monitoring has greatly increased. Look, let us, let us admit to ourselves that these wounds, ex that the wound is there. As we were just talking, that wound is there. The child knows about the wound. So why not address it through a story by which he will gain an understanding and empathy for the other side? And I don't think that any age is too early. I was working with very uh, young kids. They were nursery children in their first week of school and I was asked to come in and just, you know, do a fun day of stories with them. And in that, so they were like two and a half years old, which is when in Delhi they go to school at two and a half. So these were two and a half year old bachas. I asked, I don't know why I mentioned the word diet for some reason, dieting. And I thought, oh, they're never going to know what a diet is. So I said, do you know what a diet is? They all knew. And I said, what is it? When It's when mummies stop eating to become so I said, why do they stop eating? To become thin. I said, why do they want to be thin? I said, because they're ugly if they're fat, na? Now, would it be, would two and a half be too young to do a book on body image? Of course, surely yes. But obviously no, the sad truth is no. So I wrote a book called Elephants Don't Diet, which is, a body image book. When my daughter was about 10 years old, a friend of mine whose own children had grown up gave me a big box of books because I had said, my kids are reading so much, I can't afford to keep buying books. And so she gave me a box of books. In that, there was a really thick book and my daughter fished it out because it was uh, for... Um, uh, because it was the fattest book and she was just going to irritate my, her younger brother by reading a book which he couldn't read. Uh, that's, all, that's all. It was a book I had not read. When she started reading it, she said, Mama, you don't read this book. I said, why? She said, mm, no, um, I'll feel very embarrassed that you're reading this book um, and you'll know I've read it. So I said, okay, and I thought maybe there's a sort of love angle in it or something. After a while, about halfway through the book, she said, Mama, uh, I, I, you need to read this book. I said, why? She said, because there's some things I don't understand. And so I, I need you to read it, then I'll ask you. I said, okay. By the time she finished the book and I was sitting with her, she shut the book and she said, Mama, you've got to read this book. And I said, why? And she said, because it's a really important book. I was intrigued. I read it. And I was expecting a love story. And to my horror at that time, I found that it was a relationship between a boy and another boy. And their experiences of growing up gay. I was horrified, I was angry with my friend that she had just chucked this book in along with the others. But I asked my daughter after I finished it, I said, what did you want to ask? And her, quest her, her question brought me to tears. She said, these two boys, they just loved each other. Why was society so angry? Why were they harassing them so much? They just loved each other, what was wrong? And I realized in that, that 
had I decided for her what is the appropriate age for her to read the book, and I would want to protect her from this, she would have grown up uh, by the time, you know, like she would have developed the same prejudices, the same sniggering and laughing and all of that. Because this was her first introduction to a subject like that, she has grown up with complete understanding and empathy of other people. When she sees transgenders and hijras on the road, she's not frightened. She talks to them. I could never do that because I grew up with a fear and horror and tea. She, because of that book, didn't. So I don't think we should decide for them what is appropriate. Let them read it and if they don't understand it, they'll ask or they'll leave the book and come back to it later. We have to trust them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the message on inclusion. And I think all her writing, you definitely have to go through them. Because yesterday in her storytelling session, I was really getting goosebumps when you were reading about um, no guns at my son's funeral. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you.